The final dive at Wookiee Hole is a deep dive. Uh, the current end of the cave is below 90 metres and only Rick Stanton and John Belanthan have reached that point. I've had a few dives in this particular uh, sump over the years um, and last summer presented me with an opportunity to have another deep dive. And whilst everything didn't quite go to plan and so I didn't reach uh, the end of the cave, uh, I did come back with some video footage that I shot on a Paralens camera, um, which was helmet mounted. So the video starts with me down at 60 meters in the final sump, and you'll see me laying some line in towards what I call the first obstacle. So you can see me here placing a silt screw. This is a piece of plastic pipe. And by digging that into the gravel, into the, into the sand, um, I can tie my dive line to it when there's nothing else to tie a dive line to. Whenever I go to this bit of cave, it's quite normal to see that the uh, dive line's been washed out. I've been there a couple of times and the line that I've installed previously has, has never remained. So on this occasion, um, I'm installing uh, some thick rope, some thick line. This is some six mil uh, dive line. I've got a homemade reel, which you can see me there in the video paying out. You've also noticed, of course, that I've unclipped one of my cylinders. I'm pushing the cylinder ahead of me because I know that I'm about to get to a fairly uh, low, narrow section um, and I need that cylinder taken off. So this really is the first obstacle that you face um, when you get um, into the deep section of this final sump in Wookiee Hole. This is uh, what I call the gravel squeeze. So effectively you've got a very low section of cave. So in order to get through this section, I need to dig my way through the gravel. So I'm gonna sort of sweep with my arms and push the gravel out to the sides and that will make enough space for my body to move forward. And then I'll keep repeating that process until I can actually get through. I'm down fairly deep, you know, I'm over 60 meters here. Um, it does take a while uh, to get through this section of cave. Um, it can certainly take, you know, a good 10, maybe sometimes 15 minutes to dig my way through this section um, of the cave. You know, I'm very mindful whenever I'm here that I don't want that gravel to slump back in as well and make it harder um, for me to exit. So although this looks uh, flat, although it looks like I'm horizontal, I'm actually slightly head down. There's a little bit of an incline here as well. And obviously um, that means that the gravel is kind of naturally kind of slumping back in. So I'm pushing it to the sides, but making sure that it's gone far enough that there'll be still space for me to get out again. I finally got through the um, gravel section. I'm uh, now actually dealing with the line, uh, dealing with that line reel. But um, not only am I dealing with the line, new line that I'm laying, I've now found some of that old dive line. So line from my previous dives, um, you know, still in this section of cave, a lot of it buried, but you can see that I'm pulling it out with the silt um, and you know, there's lots of thin string everywhere. Now, the last thing you want to do when you're cave diving in a small space uh, and probably poor visibility um, is have problems with line. So I'm actually going to chop up um, some of this line, actually get rid of it, I've chop it into small pieces using my shears, then actually I can dispose of it. You know, we can let it kind of um, wash away or whatever, um, and then it'll be much safer for me to continue. So although it you know, takes a few minutes uh, and you know, I kind of want to get a, get a move on, Actually being cautious, taking time here, um, you know, and actually uh, chopping up the line is kind of um, well worth doing. You see, I'm then installing another uh, silt screw, uh, you know, putting another of these silt screws in, putting the uh, dive line through it, uh, just to make sure that I've got a nice, easy, thick line to follow on the way out. And the hope really is that that thick dive line will still be there if I go back, uh, you know, go back later um, next year. I'm just uh, looking down uh, to where the cave opens up and uh, yeah, get through there and, and carry on diving. So once you're through that first obstruction, the cave opens up again uh, and it's some, some quite nice cave diving. So it's a comfortable passage that I'm swimming along. Um, I'm sort of, you know, 66 odd meters here. So, you know, fairly deep, um, but the cave is quite nice and open at this point. Um, however, I know that it's not long until I encounter uh, the second obstacle, uh, which is, the, I think, the more significant one, certainly for me um, at this point. So 
Uh, a few minutes of swimming along, uh, you know, effectively a horizontal tunnel, uh, takes me to the next obstruction. So this is an actual collapse where uh, the rocks are blocking the way. Um, I actually have to take my cylinders off to attempt to get through this part of the cave. When this part of the cave was first reached by Rick Stanton and John Belanthan, it was impossible for them to get past. And over a series of dives, they opened the way up, uh, eventually by using a lift bag to lift a large rock out of the way. What that means, however, is that to get past this collapse, uh, you still need to squeeze between uh, some boulders. So it's fairly deep, you know, pretty much 70 meters here. I'm having to wriggle down between boulders. Um, and I've actually got to take um, not just one cylinder off this time, but I've got both my cylinders off. I've got the side mount rebreather still clipped on, but I've taken off, um, taken off the large cylinder, the, the 12 litre of Trimix that I'm using, and I'm wriggling down between the rocks here and actually pulling the cylinder down after me. Um, I spent quite a while trying to work out how to get through this bit of cave. Um, you know, I had several attempts. I've been to this point a couple of times and this is the first time I actually managed to get through this bit of cave. So what happened next, I really hadn't expected though. I've been working pretty hard, both when I was digging my way through the gravel that you've already seen, and then while swimming along to this section of cave and then the process of taking cylinders off and getting ready. I'd had one failed attempt to get in for the squeeze on this dive, and then I had the attempt where I actually got through. So I've been working quite hard. I was conscious that my heart rate was up and I guess my breathing rate was, was up as well. When I got through the squeeze, I began to feel quite uncomfortable. I began to get, I guess I can look back with hindsight now and realize I was having some of the effects of CO2 buildup. I got through the squeeze I couldn't get my breathing properly under control. I knew something wasn't right. I was having some problems breathing properly. And I decided very rapidly that I wanted to get out of there. I'd had enough. I was beyond the squeeze in a pretty intimidating bit of cave. I wasn't breathing right. I had an awful long, awfully long dive to complete to get, you know, to get out of the water. I really didn't want to be back down there. And you can see in the video, I'm moving fairly quickly. Uh, to try and get back up through that squeeze. And obviously I'm here to tell the tale. So I got back through the squeeze. I calmed myself down. My breathing rate um, got under control as well. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, I completed the dive successfully. So some important lessons there. So I have a bit of a think about modifying equipment, modifying techniques, and, um, you know, let's see if we can have another go at Wookie Hole.